Well, good morning, everyone. It is great to see you. Do come in and find yourselves a seat uh, and uh, come and uh, join with church family this morning as we gather together, as we come to worship, as we come to praise God for all that he has done for us. Today is the uh, International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church, uh, and we'll be reflecting that in our prayers a little bit later on, uh, thinking of, of all of those who don't have the freedom that we do to gather as, in the way that we are. And let's have that in our minds this morning, the freedom that we have uh, to come and worship, and uh, what a privilege that is. A little bit later on, uh, Alan is going to continue our uh, preaching series from the Beatitudes, and we're going to be looking at uh, peacemakers, which in this current climate seems like a, a really important subject object, isn't it? So looking forward to Alan, you, you sharing scripture with us uh, later on. It's been a, a few things going on this week. I expect a number of you have been having a, a slightly different routine this week because it's been half term uh, and I hope you've had some really fun things going on uh, and some good things. And I expect parents are quite looking forward to tomorrow uh, and uh, children going back. Uh, and uh, we also had uh, Vicky and Lydia uh, graduating uh, this last week. There they are, <laughs> at the Light College. Uh, and uh, that's Chris Duffett with them there, friend, friend of the church here uh, and sort of leader of the, the Light College uh, where they've both been doing their degrees. So that was a really special moment and some lovely pictures on social media. If, you, if you're friends with uh, Vicky or Lydia on social media, you'll get to see those. Anyway, let's focus in on what God has for us today. Let's pray, and then we're going to worship. Father God, it's a joy to gather. It's a privilege to gather, and we praise you for the freedom that we have to join together as church family and come freely to worship you. And Lord, we look to you today. May we encounter you. May you move powerfully in this place. May we experience you, Holy Spirit, moving amongst us, uh, encouraging us, challenging us, provoking us to become more like Jesus. Lord, will you have your way as we share together, as we share in communion a little later as the youth lead us. Lord, will you bless us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Great. Well, let's stand, uh, and we're going to worship, and Vicky's going to lead us. Have you got a scripture for us? Yes, indeed. Um, Isaiah 40, uh, verse 26. Um, Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Um, and verse 31. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Amen. If you'd like to stand, if you're able.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you that we are all your children. Lord, and uh, we don't want to see one lost. Lord, and we just pray that you would draw us close to you. As we draw near to you, draw near to us, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Ready to go. Um, yeah, to take a seat just for a minute. Um, I'm Rebecca. I lead our children, youth, and family work here at St. Peter's. Um, if you have children or young people, or even if you don't, it is very lovely to see you this morning. Um, you are very welcome here. Um, we are having our children's and youth groups today, so I'm just going to chat for a couple of minutes. We're going to do a song, and then we're going to head down to our groups. If you don't know where you're going and your age between 2 and 15, meet me on the landing after the next song, and I'll point you in the right direction. So it's been a busy week this week. Uh, the start of the week started off with our autumn family morning. Uh, we had 95 children and their families come and join us on Monday. And it was a really beautiful morning of celebrating the stuff about this time of year that is good and light and of God. Um, we had uh, uh, some, what are they called? A pet's corner thing come. Uh, and so we had Lisa Adams spent a lot of her morning holding a corn snake. Um, Sue Cockrum spent a lot of her morning holding holding a chinchilla. Um, it was a lot of fun and we got to share with our children and our families about how Jesus can be the light in us and how we can shine his light out into the world. And then Tuesday evening we had our light and our bright party which was really fun. There was a lot of glow sticks involved. We had a fire pit and we made s'mores and we had a really lovely time. That was great. And then this week coming up, we are back to normal. So Tuesday, we've got our Eden story and Bumps and Babies groups starting again. Um, we are at a point where we could do with a few extra pair of hands for both of these groups. So if you've been sort of waiting on where God's calling you to serve in the church, just have a little think on that. And if you think that might be something that God's calling you into, come and have a chat and I can tell you a little bit more about that. Next Sunday evening, we are starting our new, um, we were going to do Youth Alpha, but there's a new course that's just come out, so we're going to give it a go, which is the Christianity uh, Explored Youth Version. It's brand new, it's four weeks long. So in our evening youth slot from 5.30 till 6.30, we're going to be doing that with our young people. So if you are a young person or you know any young people and they'd love to come and join us on uh, Sunday evening, they'd be very welcome. Tell them we have pizza. And I'm sure they'll be there. Um, but it's a great safe space for them to explore faith and see uh, what that might look like for them. So we're going to do our kids' song, our family song, My Lighthouse. And I'm going to ask Ali to come and do the actions for me because she's much better at them than I am. Um, and then after that, we're going to head out, meet me on the landing if you're not sure where you're going. I'm so glad that somebody's coming to do the action. A bit tricky with the guitar. <laughs> Um, can I just echo um, what Rebecca said? Um, Monday morning was um, just fantastic, connecting with so many different families and carers of children and, and the children themselves. And the team worked really hard. Um, and, um, yeah, it was a really blessed time, really blessed time. So if please stand if you're able. We're going to sing My Lighthouse.
great job, Bam. Thank you, Ali. Really great, really good to do. Uh, so yeah, if you're a, a children or young person, do head off to your groups, and Rebecca's standing on the landing ready to receive you and point you in the right direction. If you're a visitor, please do head along. A few notices to bring you this morning, uh, and the first one is uh, what, uh, what is happening on Wednesday night, which is our special theatre production from Riding Lights, who are coming to be with us uh, and uh, present Inspired. I think um, just to get us in the mood, we should watch the video one last time, uh, and uh, we can just uh, think about whether we're going to come or not. Have we got a number of people signed up? Raise your hand if you're coming on Wednesday. That's some of you. We want a few more. We want to make sure that this is uh, sold out. We've got some people coming from other churches, I know, but uh, let's just take a look at this uh, and uh, remind ourselves all about it. What do we have here, Corporal? UXB, sir. Unexplored Bible. Hasn't been opened in ages. Well, it's our job to keep it that way. Any markings? Front, gold lettering, holy Bible, property of all saints. Very dangerous. Yes, sir. Pink maps of Paul's missionary journeys. Can't say without opening her up, sir. Oh, well, we can't risk that, Corporal. There's a full charge between those covers. Stand well back of our you, sir. A few powerful sentences might be enough. Good luck, sir. I'm approaching the UXB with the anti-exploration camping device. I'm placing the camping device around the UXB. Proceeding to tighten. What's going on? I'm experiencing resistance. I can't. There's a man on the beach shouting at us. We strained to hear him. What did he call? The peace of God be with you all. A piece of cod? He's out by a mile. Then he said, friends, have you caught a pile? Oh, we haven't enough for a seafood stir fry. Who do you think you are? Captain Birdseye. Throw your nets on the other side. Oh, give us a break. Do you think we haven't tried? I wish you could have heard it. He said he had a wonderful message, especially for us. Something about peace and change and savings and being delivered. Maybe he was from the post office. Listen. There's a house completely rammed with girls and geezers for a spoken word set by a guy called Jesus. Everyone's talking about this fresh new prophet who's touring the land without making a penny off it. He's got so many followers, he's never on his tod. Is he mad, is he bad, or the son of God? Hey, hey, stop, wait for me, hey! Hey, you, you wanna leave? Whoa, oh, right now I'm reading the Holy Prophets, man. I've got this little book, Every Day with Jehovah. Oh, doesn't it make you sick? This is the holy word of God. I meant reading in the chariot. Oh, it doesn't bother me. I just wish I understood it more. Oh, yes! It's in the back of the chariot! That's inspired! So do make sure you're here on Wednesday night. It's going to be a special night, good time to gather and uh, have some really good fellowship together. On Friday night, a uh, real deal is happening at the Granary. Uh, and uh, so the doors open at 7, I think, for a 7.20 start. Uh, they're looking at Shawshank Redemption. Uh, and that is a, a team, uh, many of which are, are from the church here who are putting, putting that on, including John Boardman. Uh, and one or two others, uh, Dave Brown included. So uh, if you're interested in that, that's Friday night this week. Just want to remind you of our Christmas stocking appeal that we're helping out uh, Home for Good with uh, and trying to partner with them. Uh, we have a target of gaining 290 pairs of socks, uh, and you should have had all the details in the weekend update. And we have a box downstairs or a, a, a bin downstairs for you to place them in. You can give financially. Just really encourage you to, to be involved with that. We really want to achieve uh, that target of 290. And I think we've made some good progress already, uh, but please do have that in mind to help with and bless some others uh, in this Christmas time. 
Uh, just to remind you that we have a prayer day coming up on the 17th of November, Friday the 17th, where we really want to take time out again and focus in on God uh, and pray and listen. And we're going to do that in a number of ways, including Celtic prayer and different prayer times and uh, some soaking time and a prayer time in the evening where we gather with some worship as well. Uh, please have that as a priority. We really want to make sure that we, we're listening well, we're praying well, we're asking God to move in, in the ways that we really feel are important uh, and are asking him to move powerfully in those, in those places. Uh, and so please do prioritize that. There's a sign-up sheet just outside the back doors uh, of the, the room here uh, that you can go and sign up for different uh, sessions. We'd love to see a good range of people helping out and, and being there and praying. If you want more information, do speak to Anne Harwood, uh, but we just want you to really put that in your diaries and prioritize that really highly, if you will. Uh, also to let you know on the theme of prayer that the prayer diaries are out for this month. We're just into November now, so we've got the St. Peter's Prayer Diary, the CSW uh, Prayer Diary is available, Open Doors Prayer Diary, uh, Barry's just standing at the back there, uh, can point you in the direction of getting an Open Doors Prayer Diary. Uh, and there's some important stuff around Gaza, I think, this month for us to pray about. Uh, and uh, just to keep digging in and praying and uh, and and. Uh, Asking God to move powerfully. It's so important that we do that. Uh, Love Russia as well is another prayer diary that is available as a hard copy, if you would like one. On the subject of prayer, I'm going to ask Tim Goodall to come and lead us this morning. Uh, thank you, Tim. Good morning. Sorry, so many bits of paper this morning. So as Andy's already mentioned, today is the uh, International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. And that's going to be the main focus of our prayers this morning. We will also be praying um, for um, church issues as well. So, uh, first of all, I will reiterate, if you want to know more about uh, the Persecuted Church, Barry is your man. And, he's, um, and he'd be more than happy to give you... Um, information and the prayer diary. So uh, the prayers we're going through this morning um, are from the IDOP website and the Release International website. Um, the International Day of, Persecuted, of Prayer for the Persecuted Church is supported um, also by CSW, Open Doors and the Evangelical Association. It's a, it's a big deal and so it should be. Paul wrote this in Corinthians, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. And that's in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 8 and 9. Persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. I was going to give you lots of data about um, persecution around the world but I'm going to do something slightly different. Um, I think these are for later on. You might have a number on your seat. I think it's telling you where you're going for communion, but I'm sure we'll be told. If you have a number seven, can you stand up, if you're able? If you have a number seven. This is a bit random. Right, and that is about roughly one-seventh of the church. And one-seventh of the church worldwide is persecuted. And we often... That's not, that's not on our radar, is it? That's not on our radar at all. But if any of these people in our church here in St. Peter's were being persecuted, we'd be praying for them day and night, wouldn't we? Wouldn't we? Yeah. I think we would. So I think that just emphasizes the importance. Thank you so much. Please sit down. So we're going to pray. So let's join in after each section with the response, God of mercy and love, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who are imprisoned because of their faith in countries like China, Eritrea, Pakistan, Iran, and North Korea, that they will know the sustaining power of God, that they will have opportunities to see their families and have fellowship with other Christians, that they will be able to share the love of Christ with their guards and fellow prisoners, and that in God's time they will be released. 
God of mercy and love, hear our prayer. We pray for the families of Christian prisoners who often face harassment, ostracism, and deprivation. We pray that God will provide for all their physical, emotional, and, emotional and spiritual needs. God of mercy and love, hear our prayer. We pray for Christian pastors and church leaders who have been detained and imprisoned in China. We pray that God will protect them from harsh treatment by the prison authorities, that their faith will remain strong, and that their testimony will encourage other pastors to keep on serving. Pray for Pastor Wang Yi, who is currently serving a nine-year prison sentence. God of mercy and love, hear our prayer. We pray for the Christians who are detained in harsh labor camps in North Korea. We ask that they will know the freedom of Christ in their hearts and have opportunities to share the hope of the gospel with their fellow prisoners. We pray for Deacon Jang, who is currently serving a 15-year prison sentence. God of mercy and love, hear our prayer. We pray for long-term Christian prisoners in Eritrea. Some, like Dr. Kiflu, have never faced trial. We pray that they will know the love and encouragement of the Lord as they spend time separated from their families and churches. We give thanks for the recent release of a long-term prisoner, Twen Tedros. God of mercy and love, hear our prayer. We pray for uh, Christians in Pakistan who have been falsely accused and incarcerated under the notorious blasphemy laws. We pray for justice and for the laws to stop being misused against innocent people. We pray that Zaf Zafar Bhatti, who has already spent 10 years behind bars, will be acquitted soon. God of mercy and love, hear our prayer. We pray for house church leaders in Iran who face the threat of arrest, interrogation, and lengthy prison sentences for their Christian work. We pray that they will continue to have, to have courage to plant and lead local churches despite the risks. We pray that the Iranian government will recognize the value of its Christian citizens. God of mercy and love, hear our prayer. We pray for all organizations serving the persecuted church in various countries who are somehow ministering to Christian prisoners of faith and their families. We pray that channels of communication would remain secure and open. We ask that practical provisions will reach those who need it most. We also ask that partners who have the opportunity to visit prisoners will have the right words to bring support and comfort. God of mercy and love. Hear our prayer. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26, If one member suffers, we all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. So finally, in this section, we pray that as Christians in the UK, we will be moved to actively remember those in prison. May God give us compassion to learn their stories to commit to praying for them, to write to them, and speak up on their behalf wherever we have the opportunity. Jesus said, Truly I tell you that if the two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. God of mercy and love, hear our prayer. Father God, we cannot ignore the warfare, the anger, the despair and the suffering in Israel and Gaza. We know the complicated and tangled history and background to this conflict goes back hundreds, if not thousands of years. While many around the world are quick to apportion blame, we pray for peace, for understanding on both sides, wisdom to those involved in diplomacy and an end to suffering in the region. We pray that all the necessary aid will reach all those in need right now. We pray for hope and healing for those who are injured, separated from loved ones, or bereaved. Give comfort to them, we ask, in Jesus' name. We especially pray for our Christian brothers and sisters in Gaza, about whom we have little or no news. Father, keep them safe 
and may they be salt and light in that dark and dangerous place. Amen. We now pray for our own St. Peter's family, particularly for all who are grieving, ill, anxious, or lonely, that they may know God's presence, comfort, and peace. We pray especially for the Plumtree family, following the recent death of Dave's father, Bob. We ask that you make their presence, your presence, known to the whole family as they gather for Bob's funeral tomorrow. Strengthen and comfort them, we pray. We continue to pray for Helen Millwood, who has returned home from hospital. Again, we pray for comfort and blessing on her as she receives a 24-hour uh, end-of-life care. We pray for Ken, her son, and the rest of her family. In a moment of silence, we remember and pray for all those known privately to us. Father God of mercy and love, receive our prayers in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. They wait in your presence. There is grace for them we need. So
Just, I just pray for Alan as he comes to share your word. I pray that you would give us ears to hear and hearts 
to receive, Lord. Um, I just pray that um, your word would fall on ground ready to receive it and, and that we would leave this place changed more into your likeness for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. It's not going to stay still, is it? <laughs> Good morning to you all. Good to see you. I have uh, two readings for this morning as we pick up our theme, another of the Beatitudes. I'm just going to read verse 7 to you from Matthew chapter 5. It says this, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And then the second reading is actually from James chapter 3, and it's verse 17 and 18. It will come up on the, uh, on the screen. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. I'm going to start this morning with something I've never ever done before. I'm going to ask you to find the answer to a cryptic crossword clue. How about that? I read it in the paper just, just this last week. And the clue is this. It's five letters. Period of calm for one after exercising. Period of calm for one after exercising. Have you got it? Who said peace? I did. You did that. Yes. Okay. There may be others, but the prize goes to, uh, to Tim, supporting me on the front row. If you don't know quite how they got that, well, the, period, the exercising is P-E, and one is ace, and you put it together and you get peace. Okay. I wonder what you think of when you think of the word peace. I immediately thought of three very different aspects of the subject. The first one, um, the UN Peace Prize. It's awarded annually, and it was awarded in October just a few weeks ago. The citation said it's awarded for work to establish fraternity among nations to reduce standing armies or to promote peace congresses. And the person who won it this year is a lady called Nagez Mohammadi. I've not heard of her before, I have to admit, and she's a women's rights campaigner, and she's currently imprisoned in Iran. Second thing I thought of is a UN peacekeeping force. In 1985, we were in Israel and visited the Golan Heights, and... Uh, on the border region between Israel and Syria, there was a UN peacekeeping force. It was established after the Six-Day War between Israel and Syria. That was in 1974. Officially, it's known as the UN Disengagement Observer Force. A bit of a mouthful. I'm sure they shortened that to something or other. Remember, we spoke to a, a soldier. It turned out he was from Austria. He seemed a bit bored. Got to have somebody to talk to. Soldiers seemed a bit lonely. The force today is still there. It consists of a thousand men, lest you think that it's just a small thing. A lot of people are involved in it. I gather mainly Nepalese and Indian at the present time from the UN. 
The irony, irony of it all is, of course, that whereas there has not been actual war again on the border between Israel and Syria, Syria itself has been involved in a civil war, as you know, and of course Israel has wars on other borders uh, very seriously at this time. UN peacekeeping force, limited success, you might say. First thing I read on the back page of the newspaper concerns a possible peacekeeper. The report said this, the captain of a premiership football club, I'm not giving the name here, was involved in a city centre brawl at 4 a.m. The manager saw a video of the incident and said he was attempting to play the role of a peacemaker. Police are investigating. I wonder what you make of that. Maybe it's not for us to judge. Three scenes relating to peace, very different. One or two serious, the last one a little bit more trivial, perhaps. But how we desire peace, don't we, in our world, and how elusive it is. Maybe peace is a bit elusive in our own hearts as well. And we'll come on to that in a little while. First thing I want to speak about this morning is the gospel of peace. The Christian gospel is good news. It's good news that we limited, sinful human beings can know peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. God is often referred to in the scriptures as the God of peace. Jesus, one of the titles uh, given to him prophetically by Isaiah was the Prince of Peace, and that's taken up elsewhere in the scriptures. God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Christ and through him to recognize, to, to reconcile to himself all things by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. How can I be confident that I'm accepted by holy, almighty God. Well, only through the merits of Jesus Christ and what he has done on my behalf. We can know the calm of sins forgiven because Jesus took our guilt upon himself on the cross. We can approach almighty God, therefore, with confidence and without fear. And we can know peace in our hearts, inner peace, because of our, uh, our restored relationship with God. I don't know how you approach communion or what you feel when we come to share the bread and wine at communion, which we shall be doing later. I pray our hearts this morning would be filled with a, a sense of awe, a sense of wonder that such a thing is possible, that our sins can be forgiven and that we are accepted, loved, received, welcomed warmly by Almighty God because Jesus, the precious Son of God, took my sins upon himself on the cross. Isn't that wonderful? Well, just leading in with the gospel of peace and the God of peace, because it ought to be a reminder to us that as followers of Jesus, the Prince of Peace, we are called to be people of peace. Peace is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit, after all. And the Beatitudes, as we've been discovering over these past weeks, are outworkings of the new life we have as members of God's kingdom as forgiven people. These are the ways that we express uh, the outworking of these things in our lives. The Greek word peace for peace is equivalent to the lovely Hebrew root word uh, shalom. 
It means far more than absence of conflict, as we've been uh, hearing before. It's a positive word. It includes well-being and wholeness, joyful fulfillment. When we think of peace, these are the things we're talking about. And so we who have experienced the peace of God should seek to be at peace with other people. Yeah? Makes sense, doesn't it? It's the outworking of um, what we have received. So we come to the seventh beatitude. Blessed are the peacemakers. Jesus doesn't say peace lovers, not even peacekeepers, but peace makers. It's a word that points to initiative. It's a word that implies action. We've had that concept um, before us recently as well. We yearn for peace and we pray for it. And that's good and right that we should do so. We may naturally have a peaceable kind of temperament. Not all of us, but some of us may be blessed in that way. We might sometimes find ourselves in the role of peacekeeper. We should be ready for that. But the blessing that Jesus highlights here is specifically for peacemakers. What does that mean in practice? Well, we'll come back to that in a moment. Just a, um, a, word, a further word on, 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 on the word blessed. Uh, it's the Greek word makarios, and in a way the statement is a bit like a, an ex exclamation. How wonderfully blessed are people who are peacemakers. How spiritually fortunate they are. And uh, the particular blessing is they will be called children of God. Interestingly, I looked at the Good News Bible translation, instead of blessed, it uses the word happy. Uh, J.B. Phillips uses the word happy. My French New Testament uh, says, heureux, forgive my French accident, uh, accent, but that means happy too. But it's actually more than happy, depends how you think of being happy. Um, but um, we've been through that other weeks, so I won't uh, dwell on that point. They will be called children of God. God is our Father, and he's the God of peace. We, as his children, should be people of peace. We should reflect the family likeness, shouldn't we? Makes sense, really. And when we're acting as uh, children of our Heavenly Father, that's what we're doing. We're reflecting the message version says, that's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. I prefer the word demonstrate there. That's when you demonstrate who you really are and your place in God's family. But did you note the delightful outcome that we read in James chapter 3? That peacemakers who sow in peace produce a harvest of righteousness. Peacemaking creates a climate of harmony in which righteousness can flourish and God's blessing can flow. We all want that, don't we? So we do. The right climate, the right atmosphere, and peacemaking uh, contributes to that. I come to two words of warning, caveats, if you will. The first one is this, that peacemaking doesn't imply Peace at any price. Sometimes we speak of pouring oil on troubled water, don't we? We know that expression. In a way, that's covering up the underlying problem issue. Smoothing it all out, hoping it'll go away. And that's re not really what we're talking about here. We're to put genuine effort into uh, peacemaking, the kind of peacemaking that will resolve the underlying issues and bring a genuine peace. Sometimes we talk of internationally, there's an uneasy peace. Maybe there's been an uneasy peace between Israel and Gaza for a number of years, and then suddenly there's a flashpoint and, and away 
uh, we go and with all the sad consequences of that. Romans 14 says, let us make every effort to do what leads to peace. That implies that sometimes it won't be easy. Or if you want Hebrews 12, verse 14, make every effort to live in peace with all people. Again, there's an implication there that that ne won't necessarily be easy. Think of Jesus. Jesus was full of grace and truth. The two in perfect harmony and balance. They work perfectly together. You see, we can't compromise truth in order to achieve a phony peace. Jesus never did that. He confronted his opponents. There are lots about that in, 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 in the Gospels, of course. Of course, we can hold different opinions on secondary issues. That's not what we're talking about. And we must learn to dis disagree graciously. But you see, Jesus definitely uh, came into conflict by those who refused to accept him or accept his message. And we can't make peace with everyone much as we would like to and seek to. For true peace will always be based on justice and righteousness. Lots of implications of what I've just said there. No time to develop them this, this morning. But my point number two is kind of implied, and that is that peacemaking has limitations. See, Jesus said something to his disciples that you might at first sight find rather strange. He was giving his disciples instructions as they went out on their first mission into the, into the community on their own. And this is what he said. It's Matthew chapter 10. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father. A man's enemies will be members of his own household. Wow. That's tough stuff, isn't it? That's tough stuff. Of course, it needs to be taken alongside everything else that Jesus said. But he was giving a warning to his disciples as to what they would expect, so that when it happened, they wouldn't be taken off guard. And if we will share God's truth and stand faithfully for it, we will often express opposition, uh, experience opposition from those who reject our message. There's almost an inevitability about that that we need uh, to recognize. I'm glad we've been able to pray today for the persecuted church. I read regularly the Open Doors literature and, and their prayer diary and so on. And it, it often records moving instances of people who became Christians and then were rejected by their families. I think this month or maybe last month, there was uh, the story about Ming in China. He became a Christian while he was away at college. He told his father about his faith, hoping that his father would accept him. Instead, he reported Ming to the police. And he had to leave home and family simply because he confessed faith in Christ. We've been reminded this morning, haven't we, of... Uh, just how many of our brothers and sisters in Christ are persecuted, often rejected by families or by their community and, and become refugees from one kind and another. I was looking up open doors and figures. Do you know that in 2022, throughout the world, there were 5,900 Christian martyrs I guess those are the ones we know about, or the open doors know about. Incidentally, I think it's generally agreed that open doors figures are, are reliable. They're well thought out and they're reliable. And uh, of course, they had an entree into Westminster as well to uh, present some of this material, which is great. Well, Paul said to the church 
in Rome, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. That's a command to us. But the other side of the coin is, it won't necessarily, in every situation, be possible to live at peace with some people. Let's come to uh, practical aspects of peacemaking, if I may. Internationally, we think of world peace. Uh, again, from Open Doors, I think it is. It, uh, uh, there are 32 ongoing war conflicts in the world at this time. We know very much about Israel and Gaza, because it's very current and in our news. Uh, we know about Russia and Ukraine, which for the moment has taken a, a sort of slightly back seat because of the other situation. But there are 30 other uh, conflicts that are ongoing. And we need to pray. We need to pray uh, for states people involved in trying to broker peace, as they call it. Um, to make peace, if at all possible, at least a cessation of hostilities, and so on. But um, I wanted to bring that down from the international level, even the level of work, which we could talk about, but down to the personal level. Um, what can we do as peacemakers? Well, first of all, we can help people find Jesus, uh, the Prince of Peace. Again, from Isaiah's prophecy, he says, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation. Wouldn't you like to have beautiful feet? Metaphorical, of course. <laughs> but, um, and that verse is taken up again in uh, Romans um, by, by Paul. Well, I thank God for every initiative we have in this church to reach out to others, whether it's Alpha or children's and young people's work, by the coffee shop, by a personal witness. In a way, there's no better, no more lasting thing we can do for people than to introduce them to Jesus. Is there? Um, let's pray that uh, our efforts will be fruitful and God will be pleased by his spirit to draw other people into the family of God, coming to recognize their need and uh, kneeling at the cross and, and seeking God's forgiveness. But I've got two more points to share with you this morning. And the first is we need to be uh, peacemakers in the family situation. We've all got families and circles of friends and so on. Tell you something I've discovered over the years, and that's this, that discord in families isn't unknown. <laughs> Sadly, some families today, these are not necessarily Christian families, of course, but some families, we've given them the term dysfunctional, haven't we? Having said that, there are one or two dysfunctional families within the, fa within the church. And uh, that's a serious matter. There are issues there that could be addressed, need to be addressed. Sometimes people that are close relationally are not close in any other way. And uh, something happened a year or two ago, fall out over a will. I, it could be all manner of thing. And uh, they've never made peace. Well, that's sad. You know your own situation. You maybe know a scene that needs you to act as peacemaker in some way. I wonder if you're up for the task. Keeping my eye on the clock and it's going round as it always does. Now, secondly, I wanted to talk about peacemaking in the body of Christ. I'm going to say something again which might just evoke the little titter of laughter that we got a minute ago, laughter. Not all relationships in the local church are sweetness and light. Let's have a titter for that one. 
Maybe that's because it comes a bit close to home. But you see, Paul said to the church at Ephesus, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. I think that implies that sometimes effort will be needed. We don't always agree about things, uh, especially, well, secondary things I'm talking about, not the heart of the gospel. And sometimes that can lead to disunity. I looked at the message paraphrase for this verse. It says, be alert at noticing differences and quick at mending fences. I think where there's a disagreement, where there's a fallout, that's a good phrase to keep in mind, isn't it? Be quick at mending fences. I want you to know I'm really very thrilled and encouraged by the climate of, of, and atmosphere uh, that God has been pleased to work in us as a fellowship of his people here in St. Peter's. We're not perfect, of course. I'm sure there are issues that still need attention. But I thank God uh, for the climate. We need to be on our guard to preserve that climate, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. Remember that Paul needed to address two ladies in the church at uh, Philippi. They weren't just any old ladies. They were two valued workers, co-workers in the church, if you read it in Philippians. And what, what was his appeal? He appealed to them to agree with each other in the Lord. Fortunately, we don't know what their disagreement was. Otherwise, we might say, well, that excuses us because we wouldn't disagree on something like that. But it, it kind of puts us on guard, doesn't it? Is there anything where I'm in disagreement and that's causing a break of fellowship with somebody else here. These two ladies have gone down in history. Not good to be known in history, really, is it, for a, a disagreement that needed Paul to address in one of his letters. I recall um, two men in my church elsewhere uh, who were in strong disagreement over something. It wasn't within the church, it was in their business lives. It was over a housing issue. One was the housing manager at the local authority, and the other one uh, was a property owner. And they were in disagreement. Really, at daggers drawn over it. And there was an important meeting coming up so after the service on the Sunday morning, one of them came to me and said, can you meet with the two of us urgently? I mean, like now, um, we must resolve this issue before this meeting takes place later in the week. It could have been tomorrow. I don't recall that detail. <sighs> Tell you what, I had a late Sunday lunch that day. <laughs> But it was worth it. I, li I heard them both out. And it was interesting that as we sat down together, starting with a prayer, and the one spoke, the other spoke, it became evident what the issue was really all about. And it all hinged on a, a misunderstanding, poor communication, and um, one of them admitted that he got it wrong and asked the other to forgive him for whatever. And uh, after about half an hour, <laughs> we prayed and went home. I was so, that was quite a stressful, draining <laughs> thing, I assure you. They were both men well able to express themselves and quite powerful in their own orbit, as it were. But... Um, God led us to reconciliation. I was really glad that that was so because um, about a year later, I actually took the funeral of one of the two people involved. And as I did so, not that I referred to it, of course, but in my mind was this meeting and how God had worked to resolve the issue with another brother in Christ in the congregation. I was acting as a peacemaker. 
I wonder if there are any situations that you're involved in or you're aware of where God might be calling you to um, act in a similar fashion. Well, if there are unresolved issues with another brother or sister here, for example, uh, Paul gives, um, uh, sorry, Jesus gives practical advice. Comes actually later on in our chapter, Matthew 5. He says, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and then remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, and then come and offer your gifts. You might like to look up the message paraphrase of that. There's no time to, um, to go through it now. Be quick to mend fences. I was once in the communion service, or we were preparing for communion, and the person leading it said, I feel we should stop. I feel there are people here that are not on good terms with one another, and I'm going to give some minutes opportunity for you to go to them and pray with them and sort it out. Now, I'm not suggesting we do that this morning. It's the only time I've ever had that happen. It seemed a bit embarrassing at the time, as undoubtedly it was. Maybe that's not even the way to do it. But you see, Jesus' words are very clear. When we come to communion, expressing the fact that we're at peace with one another, we share the peace with one another, that mustn't be some kind of phony peace. It's got to be a peace that's whole and wholesome, and, uh, and uh, you get what I'm saying. You get what Jesus is saying and how important it is that we would mend fences. Well, I wonder what God is saying to me today, what he's saying to you. We said peacemaking it was an action word. I wonder if there's any area of conflict that I need to be acting upon in my own life or in the life of those close to me. Maybe difficult work, it certainly won't be easy necessarily, but I tell you what, just keep in mind the harvest of righteousness that will ensue, yes? I need to close, and we need to move towards communion, but I want to close by just uh, saying as a prayer the opening lines of the song we just sang. So if we just bow together, pray be, maybe just make the prayer your own in this quiet moment. Make me a channel of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me bring your love. Where there is injury, your pardon, Lord. And where there's doubt, true faith in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Alan, food for thought. <laughs> um, so as we um, approach communion, um, God just laid this song um, on my heart for us to, to to draw in to His table. So if you'd like to stand, um, we'll sing when I survey.
like to take your seats as we journey uh, towards communion and sharing. Let us have those, those thoughts, what God has been speaking into our hearts this morning. Uh, let us be dwelling upon those things. Let us think about those things. Is God saying something to you that you need to put right today? We have a lovely thing to do now. I always say that, but it is lovely. Uh, we are going to welcome two people into membership of the church. So I'd like to invite Kate and Laura uh, to come to the front and join me up here, if you will. Thank you. Yeah, let's uh, welcome them to the front. Both Kate and Laura have um, recently felt God really establishing them here. Do come up to the, onto the platform. Uh, and uh, both been through foundations course and talking about the vision and values of the church and being aligned with those things. We've recently seen uh, Laura be baptized, which has been lovely, and now it's the opportunity to, to welcome you into the life of the church as members, uh, all that commitment that, yeah, we're here, we share in what the church is doing and journey together. So we've got a couple of questions which we're going to ask you. The response is nice and simple. It's I do, and then uh, I'll ask the church a, a question, uh, and it's we do, and then we share a few words together at the end. So let me ask you these questions. As a member of this church, do you promise to share your life and your journey of faith with these people and in this place? Do you promise to support the church and its worship, vision, and mission to the best of your ability according to your gifting and by the Holy Spirit? So a question to the congregation, if you'd like to stand. So do we as a church promise to love, pray for, and encourage each new member, helping them to flourish in this place? Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Let us share in these words together. Let us walk together before God in ways that are known and yet to be made known, gathering for worship, seeking the mind of Christ, praying for God's kingdom, and sharing in its life and witness. Amen. Amen. And so we have a, a card for each of you. And uh, just welcome you into the life of the church. Welcome, uh, and you, Laura. Isn't that great? Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you both. You can uh, take your seats. 
And if you are interested in coming into membership of the church, we're going to be running a foundations course uh, just at the beginning of December. I think it's the, uh, it's the f- 5th of December. Thank you, uh, uh, Al, who's always on it. Um, and if you would like to talk to me about that, becoming a member, uh, just committing that bit further and being aligned, then uh, let's have a conversation. Uh, and it'd be great to welcome you to the foundations course where we explore all of that uh, in early December. We're going to head into communion, and it's really special this morning uh, as our our young people are going to be leading us uh, in sharing bread and wine together. But Alan has challenged us about a number of things. Uh, Let us be humble. Let us contemplate those things. Let us recognize where maybe we need to take action, uh, maybe before or after communion this morning or in the days ahead. Let us be people who are peacemakers. Let us be those people who represent the kingdom of God in that way. Let us come before this, this table recognizing how flawed we are how many mistakes we make, but the grace and mercy and the love of God that is given to us and what Jesus did for us on the cross. So I'm really pleased to ask Rebecca to come up and explain what's going to happen. Uh, let us uh, just focus in on this special time. We're going to share in different ways and in different places around the building. Thanks, Rebecca. So you won't be shocked to hear me say that we're going to do it a little bit differently this morning to how we usually do. Um, Our young people have worked really hard. They've been looking at the story of the Last Supper and what it looked like when Jesus took communion with his disciples. And so we've tried to sort of base what we're doing a little bit around that first experience of the Last Supper this morning. So I'm going to explain the logistics now and then we can get into a place of worship to do communion in a few minutes. So We're going to do this in small groups, and we're going to be using the whole building. So on your chair, you should have a little piece of paper that allocates you to a group, okay? Three of the groups are in here. There's going to be a group in room two, which is just at the end of the corridor up here, and then there's going to be four groups downstairs. It should tell you really clearly on your piece of paper which group you need to head to. If, for whatever reason, the group that you've been allocated doesn't work for you, if it's difficult for you to move around the building, or if you need a free-from bread option, we have catered for this. So if you need free-from bread, you're going to join group number one, which is going to be meeting over here. So just ignore what's on your paper and come and join this group. If mobility is a bit of an issue and it's much easier for you to stay in here, just join one of the groups in here. We've catered for about 20 people per group, so look at the one that looks like it's the quietest and join that group, okay? It should be really obvious on your paper, but if for whatever reason that doesn't work, then just join a different group. If you're heading to one of the groups that isn't in here, again, we've allocated about 20 people a group, so if you join a group and it looks really busy, but the one next to it is really quiet, then just make that very grown-up decision all by yourself about which group you would like to join, okay? Um, we do have a few spares of things if we need it, okay? Okay. Um, The young people are going to be leading each group. So you're going to have a young person who's going to lead you as a small group through communion. And then we're going to end, hopefully, by everybody all over the building saying our closing prayer together. And then we will head straight into coffee. So you don't need to come back up to here um, when we finish. Our young people have worked really hard. They've written the script together. They've put all of this together. um, And they're really quite excited to serve God in this way. So we're going to play a little video that our young people have made about what communion is and then I'll just pop up quickly for a few seconds after that and then we'll head to our groups. Have you ever wondered why every once in a while at church people eat a small piece of bread and drink a tiny bit of juice? Is it just snack time or is it or is there more to it than that? Well this is what we call communion. Communion is something that the church has done for thousands of years but what exactly is communion? Why do we do it? To answer that, we should look all the way back at the very first communion. Before Jesus went to the cross, he had one last meal with his disciples. While they were all there, Jesus took a cup and told his disciples to divide it among themselves. Then he broke up some bread into smaller pieces and gave a piece to each of his disciples. When Jesus had them all take and eat the bread, he said, This is my body, Luke 22 verse 19. The bread represented his body that would be broken. When they all took the cup, Jesus told them, This is my blood. Mark 14, 24. The cup represents his blood that was going to be poured out 
as a sacrifice for them on the cross. When they ate the bread and drank the cup, he told his disciples, do this in remembrance of me. This is why we take communion to remember Jesus and what he did for us. The bread and the cup are physical symbols that Jesus gave us to remind ourselves of, think of something much bigger that he did for us. When we eat the bread, we should remember that Jesus' body was broken the day he went to the cross. Because of that, we can have healing, not just physical healing, but emotional healing and spiritual healing as well. Jesus was broken, just like the bread, so that we could be made whole. Jesus was that perfect sacrifice. When we drink the cup, we should remember that it's only because of Jesus' blood that we are able to be born again into God's family. Without Jesus' sacrifice, we would be doomed to be separated from God forever because of our sin. The bread and the cup are just a physical way to remind us of the amazing things that Jesus did for us. Yeah, well done, guys. That was a really good job making that. So we just want to stay in this place of worship, um, stay in this place of reflecting on what Alan's been talking about as we head to our groups. And quite often we do something called sharing the peace, which sounds a bit funny if you don't know what that is. Um, but we so go to each other and we say, the peace of God be with you. Um, so as we head to our groups, we're going to share the peace as we go. So just try and stay in this place of worship. Don't start chatting about what you're having for your lunch. Um, Stay in this place, share the peace with each other as you head to your groups um, and Sam is going to come and he's going to play and you'll be able to hear Sam's music all around the building, okay? So when you're ready, off you go. Children are included in this as well, so if, you're, if you've had a chance to chat with your parents about whether you're joining in or not, do that on your way to groups, okay?
bring our service to a close with our usual ending prayer. Lord God, lead us out onto our front lines. As, we, as you lead us out onto our front lines, help us to love you, each other, and our communities. Release the gifts you've given us and to invite others to meet with Jesus. Amen. <laughs>